Christ's command to his followers before his ascension to heaven was for them to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. Our Lord did not intend for the good news of his death and resurrection to stay local, but instead it was to be taken globally. In this third section of Acts, the adventure continues as the gospel is taken to the ends of the earth. Let's join Scott Pauley now for today's study. There is one recorded prayer request of the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel records, and it is this. He said, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Isn't that an interesting thing? That the one thing Jesus said, you better pray for this. He said, pray for workers. Pray for laborers. Why would that be? May I tell you that the longer I'm in the Lord's work, the more I understand The Lord Jesus understood. He knew Uh, the great lack is not for work to be done. The great lack is not for financial resources. The great lack is not for programs and ideas. Uh, The great lack is not for souls to be won. The great lack is always for laborers. Where are the laborers? Friend, I'm going to tell you what we need right now. We need workers. Every local church I know needs workers. And frankly, every local church ought to be sending out workers into the harvest field. I cannot believe, I just cannot believe that at the end of the world, the end of the age, on the verge of the second coming of Jesus Christ, with more lost souls on the planet than have ever lived at any time in history, that the Lord would be calling fewer people into his work. No, I think the Lord is still calling the workers, but I think perhaps we're not listening. And if we are listening, we're not obeying. We've come today in our study of this great adventure in the book of Acts to a pivotal point in Acts chapter number 13. This is uh, the record of the first intercontinental missionaries. (laughs) This is uh, the record of what God is setting in motion now with Saul, who is getting ready to be known as the Apostle Paul. At the end of chapter 12, we left Barnabas and Saul. Notice Barnabas' name still first. Saul at this point is not the most prominent of the two in the team. That's about to change. Chapter 13, we pick up the story here. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manon, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Fascinating. Saul is actually at the end of the list. Perhaps at this point, he's the the least likely among them, uh, the least to, to... be the point of the tip of the spear, the leader of the group, and yet God's going to make him that. I would also point out to you in that verse that you have quite a combination of backgrounds, uh, cultural backgrounds, language backgrounds, experience. Uh, It's fascinating to see the uh, hodgepodge, if you will, of people. But friends, that's the miracle of the church. Look, where can you go and find people from so many different backgrounds worshiping together, coming together, uh, people that come from different perspectives and yet find their commonality in the person of Jesus Christ. It is the mystery and the miracle of the local New Testament church. The Bible says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Did you hear the phrase, the work whereunto I have called them? Oh, I'm just praying right now, even as I'm talking to you, I'm I'm talking to the Lord in my heart. Dear Lord, laborers, even now, dear God, call some people into the work of the Lord. Uh, We need more men willing to preach the gospel. We need more godly women engaged in the work of the Lord. We need more families connecting uh, their their energy, their time, their resources to the cause of evangelizing this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I would point out to you, it all started not as they ministered to others, but as they ministered to the Lord. Isn't that interesting? It's in the place of prayer. They're praying and fasting. That's when it all was set in motion. Uh, God chooses 
those who are close to him. God sends those who have drawn near to him. Uh, If you want God to show you something significant to do with your life for the glory of God, get as close to the Lord as you possibly can. And as you get engaged ministering to him, God will make you a minister to other people. Let me point out three key words today, may I? Because really everything in these opening verses about these workers hinge on three words. First of all, the word said. The Bible says the Holy Ghost said. So first of all, God speaks. This is where it all begins. God speaks to people. I really believe this. God calls people, not in some booming voice, not audibly. Uh, It would appear here that the voice was not an audible voice because the emphasis is on the Holy Spirit. But there's a speaking. God is speaking to the church, and God is speaking to Barnabas and to Saul. He's always working on both ends. I wonder, is God speaking to you? Is the Lord dealing with you? Listen to the call of the Holy Spirit. Then the second word is the word separate. The Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. We usually think of separation always from the negative, but separation is always positive before it's negative. It's not from something first. It's always to something. In fact, it's to someone. It's to the Lord. The Holy Spirit said, I've called them to work. Separate Barnabas and Saul to the work I've called them to do. Uh, I would point out to you, the Holy Spirit is a real person. He's speaking. (laughs) He's having a conversation. And the Holy Spirit reveals the will of God. So uh, God speaks. He calls. Then the church separates certain labors. They, They see God at work in those people. I really believe that when God calls people into his work, Uh, It will be evidenced by spiritual people. Other people will see that in them, and the church sets them apart. Then the third word is the word sent. When they'd fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. In fact, the next verse, verse 4 says, So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed into Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. I would ask you a question. Who sent them? Verse 3 says the church sent them. Verse 4 says the Holy Ghost sent them. So who sent them? The answer is both. The church was just doing what the Holy Spirit wanted done. The Lord sends his own laborers. We don't call workers. God calls his own workers. Uh, But when the Lord calls someone, then the church that God has given authority to identifies the call of God on that person's life and cooperates with the Holy Spirit and together send them out for the work of the Lord. I say again, friends, we need workers. We need people who will listen to God speak. We need people who will be willing to let their lives be separated to the Lord and to the work of the Lord. And we need people who are willing and ready to be sent. I wonder, is that you? Are you are you willing to be one of the Lord's workers? You know, we shouldn't pray if we're not willing to obey. So when we pray for God to send others Uh, there's a hypocrisy in that. We should be willing to say, as Isaiah did, here am I, Lord, send me. Would you begin today to make this your prayer? Would you pray for laborers? And as you pray for laborers, would you just say to the Holy Spirit, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to do it, however I can get engaged, use me as well. I do think it's very important. It was as these men were praying and fasting, God set this in motion. And then what did the church do? They prayed and fasted. I'm convinced if we had more praying Christians, we'd have more going Christians. If we had more Christians seeking the Lord, we'd have more Christians seeking the lost. We need workers. Though no more scripture is being written, the story of the furtherance of the gospel is being written at this very moment. And we get to be part of that story. The heart of our Savior is as passionate for the lost today as it was just before he ascended in Acts 1. Will you get in on what God is doing in the world today to reach the lost with the gospel? This is why Enjoying the Journey exists, to encourage and to equip you in the work of the gospel. Whether it is through the daily broadcast or the many resources on our website, Scott and all of us on the Enjoying the Journey team are passionate about people coming to know Christ as Savior. 
we pray that you truly will enjoy the journey. But we also pray that you will bring others with you on your journey of following Christ.